Welcome back to What in the World. I am Ryan, joined by Andre, David, and Andrea. A lot has happened this week. Andre, before we kind of dig into that, how are you? I'd like to know how everyone is, because now that we have more people involved, it's not just you and I shooting the wind. We have some more friends to talk about what is happening in our own lives in addition to what is happening in the world. Shooting the wind. Yeah, shooting the wind. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you would like to know how I am, right? I'm sure you really would. Uh, hey, we're actually <laughs> friends in real life. I'm doing good. No, no, yeah, we are actually friends in real life, Ryan. Uh, no, no, it's been good. I have my Christmas decorations all decked out in my studio apartment and all of that. But uh, and anyone else getting ready for the holidays? Ryan, are you getting ready for Hanukkah? I am getting ready for Hanukkah. Uh, I have a box of all my holiday stuff that I have slowly moved from the top shelf to the middle shelf. And in a couple of weeks, it'll come out and I'll start to actually, you know, put some Hanukkah decorations up. Um, so yes, I'm excited. I'm also excited for Thanksgiving. It's not my like favorite holiday because um, I feel like the food's kind of boring, but it's always fun to get you know together with family. So well, it's only boring if you make it boring. <laughs> All right. I feel like talking about, bland I, I'm done talking about personal things because now I just feel a little subconscious now that you are roasting me at 8 a.m. in the morning. So I'm going to kick it over Maybe to someone you else. Roast a turkey. Oh, okay. I'm done. No, that's very fair. And I think the key words in your sentences, Ryan, were in the next few weeks, you'll be getting ready for holiday stuff. Andre is the only person I know who gets ready for, <laughs> for Christmas after Halloween. Before Halloween. I, I lugged that tree across D.C. on October 30th. Oh, God. At, in the middle of the night, <laughs> in the downtown Washington, D.C., I had a massive tree on my back or in my grocery cart. Oh, my goodness. I'm sure people Hilarious. were. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I could ever do it that early, but I admire the spirit for sure. David gifted me eggnog on like October 7th. Well, don't, I mean. don't rope me into this. Uh, yeah, Andre is the only one I know that has been getting ready that early and was maybe the only person I know that is in line for pre-sales of eggnog. I am just busy getting ready for the holidays, although I haven't decorated anything. Um, but I did get a tree this year, so still need to put it up. Um, a fake tree, not a real one. Looking forward to actually decorating my own place for the first time this year. But still need to do that. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that I we can sense the joy in your in your voice. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm glad that we we were able to talk about ourselves, but also roast Andre in the course of doing so. So that's a good start to my morning. Um, all right. We're not really here to talk about ourselves, even though I, I enjoy doing it, and maybe our listeners do too. But we can. But let's. It's our podcast. <laughs> you're right. Let's talk about what in the world is happening. I think we should start with the G20. Uh, that occurred in Indonesia this year. Um, a lot of that kind of came out of this year's events between basically the West and China. Uh, President Biden, for the first time as President of the United States, met with China's Xi Jinping. Uh, they had a bilateral meeting. There was also some fanfare around meetings with uh, Xi and Justin Trudeau uh, of Canada. Um, so I'd love to get people's thoughts on kind of the outcome of this G20 not a really a lot of like substantive policy, but like high geopolitics, some Russia condemnation, and just some interesting conversations on the sidelines. Well, Biden and Xi Jinping, I mean, they have a more longstanding uh, relationship uh, because back in the Obama administration in the early 2010s, when Xi was sort of the equivalent of vice president in China, uh, he and Biden uh, would meet, uh, I think. Biden had actually written about it in his more recent uh, autobiography meeting with Xi Jinping and sort of the scene in the school and so on. So Biden knows Xi. Xi knows Biden. But this is the first time they've actually met in person uh, since Biden took office, even though it's been almost two years. And uh, both of them said that, you know, nothing, you know, they have they have been having communication, but nothing can really replace that face-to-face -face sort of meeting. And uh, essentially, the meeting was three hours sought to address a lot of their differences. Because again, we've been seeing a lot of US-China tension, especially around Taiwan, a lot of tension around Taiwan. And this was the first time in person that these two leaders got to sort of hash it out. Uh, and I'd say President Biden came out of that meeting on a more optimistic note. Apparently, they're going to be restarting a lot of the uh, climate 
the discussions that the U.S. and China are having uh, that were essentially called off because of some of these Taiwan tensions. Again, remember Nancy Pelosi visiting Taiwan a couple of months ago, very controversial, irked the Chinese. The Biden administration really didn't have any control over Pelosi's visit, but it seemed to be a bit more optimistic, at least coming out of that meeting. Uh, Guys, any other thoughts on that meeting? Any reactions, I guess? Yeah, yeah. No, I'd agree. In terms of reactions, I think, you know, again, playing on on the words that you use, Andre, very optimistic. Um, We don't have any very substantive policy decisions that did come out of that. Um, But, you know, you definitely feel the downplaying of you know, both both the sides of aggression and kind of just hostility that has been playing, you know, there's, quote unquote, no need for a second Cold War. Um, so it's it's very exciting news to hear that Blinken will be visiting China next year. Um, and I think, you know, that could potentially open the door for new paths of diplomacy. Um, but, you know, thinking ahead just to all the aggression around Taiwan, um, it's important to have diplomatic paths to at least think had to potential conflicts that would need to be resolved. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to see too. I know that you know the talks were productive um, in a lot of ways, and also with uh, Yellen meeting with China's top finance um, official for the Chinese National Bank. Uh, also, apparently had some productive talks, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. Um, I know they did mention that even though they want to cooperate with each other, they're still going to be competitive. Um, And Biden and other, some other Western leaders also laid out, um, I think, a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So it'll be interesting to see how, what that interplay is between being cooperative with each other on certain issues, but still being competitive and, and how, you know, which one ends up possibly, you know, changing the fate of the U.S.-China relationship. or whether they'll be able to compete with each other in a way that's more productive rather than hostile. Um, So it'll be interesting to see how that shapes out over the next few years. Well, talking about hostility, uh, Xi Jinping and Justin Trudeau, the Canadian prime minister, had a little bit of a tense on-camera little exchange. Uh, Basically, Xi and Justin, you know, during the G20, are always having these bilateral meetings uh, throughout the meeting in between all the group meetings, and Xi and Justin had had one. And apparently, Xi accused Justin Trudeau of leaking out all the details of that meeting uh, to the press, because apparently they had leaked out. And uh, Trudeau, you see this on camera, is like, well, you know, we're committed to a free and frank and open dialogue in Canada. Uh, Xi was not impressed uh, and he just looked a bit annoyed, if not angry, speaking through his translator. But uh, it, it was a, just an interesting moment to see that on camera, just because Xi Jinping, it, it just feels like he has such a curated image, right? And many other people have written this in articles. He has such a curated image. It's interesting to see him, I don't know, get angry in public on camera when he knows he's on camera yeah it's a it's a very interesting point and it really seemed like he had swagger right when he when you looked at the his kind of his body language and he would kind of look to the, like away from trudeau almost like you know a, a disappointed teacher talking to a pupil uh and and the fact that like the, the mutual respect that he clearly demonstrated with with biden was not really present with trudeau and so i think this kind of shows that she is very comfortable on the world stage that he knows China's place as a major power and doesn't maybe have the requisite respect for other world leaders. No, you nailed it on the head, Ryan. When I watched that video on Twitter, um, I felt as if I were being scolded myself. Um, It was a little uncomfortable to watch, but you could see kind of how terse the conversation was and how quickly I, I, you know, it appeared that Trudeau walked away. Um, Yeah, it was just an uncomfortable moment for sure. Even watching on the sidelines thousands of miles away (laughs) yeah very very interesting and so um the g20 um is always interesting Uh, another part of the g20 that just to mention as we kind of transition into talking about ukraine is that uh volodymyr Zelensky, um the president of ukraine called it the g19 obviously because he doesn't want russia to be included um and and with that uh, a lot has kind of happened in the news surrounding the war in ukraine a a missile landed in Poland. And in the initial kind of reporting of this, it was thought that maybe Russia had either deliberately or accidentally 
fired a, a missile that landed in Poland. Uh, since then, NATO has come out, Poland has come out saying that it was a Ukrainian defense missile, most likely that landed in Poland. Interestingly, Volodymyr Zelensky um, and the Ukrainians have said that it was not their missile. Uh, so that kind of leads to kind of a clash of narratives. Um, and uh, again, the threat of escalation when we see things like this, of course, you know, Russia has been sending barrages and and just missile after missile into Kiev and other surrounding regions, particularly um, in the east, but also in the west of Ukraine, which again, borders NATO, NATO member states, including Poland. Uh, and so it was really tense. I mean, if you were on Twitter, you were seeing like hashtag World War Three, hashtag Article 5, which of course is used by member states to in- invoke the kind of mutual defense pact. Um, that has not happened. Uh, it does not seem like there is going to be any heightened kind of mobilization by NATO member states, but still scary stuff. Yeah, there was a photo of, I think, Biden, Blinken, and I think Jake Sullivan in their, basically their nightwear in Indonesia at night during the G20 trying to figure out how to address this. But uh, Zelensky initially stated that it was a Russian missile, right? But now we know that it may have been a Ukrainian missile that had been fired to deter a Russian missile that had fallen into Poland. Is that is that what the story is now? That's what I'm seeing. That's what NATO has said. That's what Poland is saying. That's what the United States is saying. Ukraine is the only one that is is claiming that it was not their missile. Um. So, yeah, take that as you will. Well, that looks pretty bad if it, if it was their missile, right? Because it killed two Polish yeah, civilians. Yeah, I will so. say NATO... Um, the NATO Secretary General did say that at the end of the day, like this is Russia's fault. Um, of course, Ukraine was attempting to defend themselves. And when you have defense missiles, right, I mean, it's it's imperfect. Um, they're, of course, being fired into the air to strike down a an offensive missile. And in so doing, right, it can either launch incorrectly, it could hit the missile and then maybe land somewhere else. And so, yes, of course, if it's a Ukrainian missile that kills someone, it's a problem. But uh, the the blame is still being levied on Russia when you're looking at the NATO member states. Going back to the G20, what was the condemnation of Russia like at the G20? Like, because I know we have some divisions. Yes. Th- so there are divisions. But I think most interestingly is that India and China are distancing themselves from Russia. Both of these countries are far more friendly with Russia than almost any other state. Um, but we saw both of them kind of walk a very fine line of not endorsing it at all, but also, you know, condemning to the extent where, like they're saying, war should never be the option. They shouldn't be engaging in this. Um, but there was kind of this resolution that emerged out of the G20 condemning Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Um, and we also saw that, you know, likewise in the United Nations, something of resolution being passed that doesn't really happen. Um, so, yeah, it seems like the world almost almost the entire world is um, on board with condemning Russia for its war against Ukraine. Well, you know, now India is going to get the presidency of the G20, getting it from Indonesia. And India, as a couple of articles I read uh, stated, is a country that's being courted by so many other countries because they are sort of the uh, intermediary, not intermediary, because they're not really doing any negotiations, but they're like the common friend of many enemies, right? India and Russia have had long-standing relations. India gets weapons from Russia, which much to the ire of the United States, but the United States can't really do anything about that. And uh, Narendra Modi is, is seen as really leading India to a new sort of uh, visage on the world stage. So India's found itself in a in a an interesting spot in between the United States, in between China, in between Russia, India and China have had some tensions over the past few years, but I think those are on the up and up, but not always on the up and up. It's always sort of gray how those relations are progressing. But in terms of India, Russia, US, it's a very interesting thing to observe, especially as India takes a G20, and especially as India's power is rising. I just wanted to make that note. Yeah. When you look at India from just like the population scale, the economic scale, it's a huge producer of of arms and, and uh, even services and goods. And so it's an important player, um, particularly in its you know region of the world, as, as everyone kind of knows, it's also trying to elevate its status on the world stage. Uh, and so I, I imagine the United States will be working extremely hard with its partners to elevate its relationship with India to ensure that it doesn't have any close relations with Russia or even have, you know, a warming with China, as, you know, we talk about strategic competition um, among the world powers. Yeah, definitely. So I want to move into Iran. 
on social media, you you may have seen a lot of posts about 15,000 protesters being executed or being given death sentences by the Iranian government. But that is false, apparently. There, that report is false. It is some misinformation. But what what is the real information? Uh, do, do any of you guys have the real information on, like, who, if anyone's getting executed in these Iranian protests? Well, yeah, just speaking on, you know, the misinformation that came out of that, um, I also saw that, uh, I feel like, everywhere on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and it was definitely pretty shocking, even with everything going on there, that seemed like a huge escalation. Um, so I also was interested to hear all your thoughts on on that and, and how that can also, you know, cause spiraling effects if, you know, people think it's real and the threat of, you know, conflict with Iran increases because of that. Um, so I thought that was, that was one interesting thing, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, in terms of what is actually going on um i know they have started to ha- hand out more uh death sentences i think they've had um in addition to the people that have just been killed during the protests themselves um i think they've had at least three um death sentences maybe four um and i'm sure those will continue to increase as it looks like protests are not dying down anytime soon um and are escalating in different regions of the country um so it'll be i'm not sure how this will progress i know that the iranian regime has stated a no tolerance policy moving forward um i think a week or two ago was was some kind of you know end date they listed for protests and that they were going to really ramp up um severe penalties for anyone that continued past that date so since the protests haven't really died down i'll be um I guess interested to see um what happens there and if you know they back down in any way or if they continue to ramp up their uh penalties and and even death sentences for protesters um but it does look like you know the 15,000 number um was either misinterpreted or really blown out of proportion even Justin Trudeau shared that out even his Twitter account had shared that out that's a prime minister of a major country yeah I mean I think it was shared by I don't remember exactly which journalist was the first one that shared it but I know it was definitely a, a known to I at least I think known to be a reputable journalist who got some false I think they had a um reputable witness but the witness received false information so it was you know they weren't I don't think intentionally putting out false information but it was just a kind of fluke um, error uh, but yeah definitely definitely kind of scary to see that how quickly stuff like that can spread no exactly David I think I saw you know at least a couple of infographics shared on people's Instagram stories with that 15,000 number as well um, I think you know it's also important to note that we've seen uh, you know Iran at least put a little bit of the blame on Western countries as well I think in the past couple of weeks I've read that you know, there are increased uh, risks of an Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia. Um, We see Iran potentially targeting individuals living in Western countries. Um, You know, what do you all think in terms of, you know, the protests that are happening in Iran and, you know, international security as a a whole, um, when Iran seeks to, to punish people outside of their own borders for, you know, what they perceive as being a root cause for the social unrest within the country. Yeah. Uh, Again, I think we'll kind of follow to see the evolution of not only, you know, Iran's response to these mass protests, but how the protest movement itself uh, evolves. Uh, And so until then, I mean, you know, we have to be very kind of scrupulous about the information. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of retractions by major journalists, even, you know, major kind of public figures that have, elevated kind of this this misinformation and so as as we talked about last week misinformation is a huge problem particularly on platforms that everyone uses as a you know a real source of information and so here's another fantastic example of how this can kind of go wrong um so all right moving on to something that i found fascinating uh eight billion people in this world spinning on this globe of ours that has finally happened i feel like we just hit seven billion and now 
a billion more. They were all in line for the Taylor Swift pre-sale yesterday, too. Such a bummer, man. <laughs> Couldn't get <laughs> oh, those darn tickets. Lame joke. But uh, yeah, 8 billion people. It's crazy. Uh, also has significant consequences. Uh, some of them negative as our world continues to run out of resources. Yeah, and it's important to note that this number continues to grow, albeit at you know not as quick of a pace that we've seen in the past decades here as, as population growth slows down. But like you said, Andre, you know, pointing back to our previous conversations on climate policy, migration, and international security risks as a result, I think this is, you know, something to keep your eye on and have at the back of your mind. Um, I think it was overshadowed by a lot of world news events this week. Um, so it's important to know. Yeah, uh, I I think it really just comes to the, the whole idea that we, you know, we have finite resources uh, on this planet uh, and with, you know, climate problems, with food insecurity, with migration, uh, as the population increases, so will conflicts arising out of issues that are related to a growing population and a finite number of resources, uh, something that, you know, geopolitical strategists pay attention to, historians pay attention to, uh, but something that I think the, the media and the public don't want to really think about because obviously it's kind of scary. So um, so I'm not going to think about it anymore. And we're going to move on to our last topic for today, uh, which is the United Arab Emirates and the U.S. Uh, there was a Washington Post article citing a National Intelligence Council report about the UAE's influence operations in the United States. It basically revealed that the UAE, which is a, a huge ally of the United States, a lot of economic and military cooperation over the years, uh, that the UAE has attempted to shape U.S. domestic and and foreign policy by a, a d- bunch of different means, primarily through you know monetary contributions, both legally and illegally. Uh, there are a lot of lobbying firms, law firms, kind of at the crux of this. Um, you know, of course, in the United States, we have laws that govern contributions to campaigns, um, foreign investment in the United States, uh, lobbying laws, and so since 2016, the UAE spent over 150 million dollars on lobbyists to donate to U.S. universities. Um, we typically don't see the UAE as you know necessarily a threat, but any time where you have a foreign country attempting to sway U.S. policy, it's it is a national security concern. And, and you know, Ryan, in, in terms of foreign lobbying and so on, we had a great episode with Holden Triplett, uh, and we will have more to come with him, actually. Uh, hint, hint, uh, pay attention to that. But we had an episode with him that really looked at how, well, it was spurned by what happened with General uh, John Allen from Brookings, right? Uh, he basically had to resign his post from Brookings because he was found to be lobbying for the country of Qatar. And a lot of foreign governments are basically hiring a lot of former U.S. policymakers, former U.S. military guys and gals, and so on, to figure out how do we shape U.S. policy to favor us. So yeah, the UAE isn't necessarily considered a threat to the United States geopolitically, but it's it's always disconcerting to see that this is happening, even though it definitely is happening with many, many more countries that we probably don't know a lot about, or that we're at least not aware of. But you can see how a lot of these countries, both uh, explicit foes, uh, implicit adversaries, and even perceived allies are all playing this game of influence in D.C., right? I mean, this is the swamp after all. And it's very much, you know, trying to buy influence. And we're all just living in it. <laughs> all of us, you know, other than Andrea, she, she's in New York. So she kind of gets an out. But <laughs> Andre, you, David, and, and I are all living in D.C. R- Ryan, real quick, anything about this whole crypto slump, the FTX collapse? Um, well, I've, there's a lot of thoughts on that, but we don't have too much time to dig into it. All I'll say is that, so for those who aren't aware, please dig into this FTX collapse. It is very interesting, but also important when you think about how governments regulate kind of the economy and digital currencies. Uh, The United States doesn't really have a clear-cut policy yet on digital currencies, which is why FTX was, FTX, not the US arm, but FTX, kind of this, um, the exchange was operating outside the US and based in the Bahamas, which they are investigating this collapse. So essentially, FTX, uh, did not have the assets they said they did. And so when there was a run 
on kind of their kind of internal currency. Um, it's like a bank run essentially. And so they couldn't, you know, keep up with it and it collapsed. They had to declare bankruptcy. And so it's a fall of the second largest cryptocurrency exchange. Um, and this had reverberations for the crypto market, which is already in a slump. Um, obviously, like it doesn't affect the global economy too much, but what it does is demonstrate the the risks around financial stability when it comes to these things. I mean, billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars are invested in cryptocurrencies. And so that has an impact on consumers. And so while it may not really hurt governments, other than governments that are heavily invested in it, uh, it still does impact the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I heard the uh, author or the guy who made the big short was hanging around this guy for a couple of months. So I'll be interested to see what uh, press coverage comes about of this. Yeah, to be determined. Uh, there will be investigations. Congress has already called for them. Uh, the United States government and other governments around the world are likewise investigating. Uh, we will have episodes coming out about kind of crypto and regulation in the near future. So stay tuned for that. Um, but that is our time today. Uh, any final thoughts before we depart? Nope. So, All right. Just silence. silence. Is good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Th <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this week's edition of What in the World. Uh, and we'll be back next week with the week's news. Thank you.